for our next section on competition analysis, um, we'd like to thank Norton Rose Fulbright for sponsoring this session. And our speaker today is Abraham Chang. He's a senior associate in the Houston office of Norton Rose Fulbright. His practice focuses on antitrust and complex commercial litigation. His clients represent industries, everything from energy to life sciences and healthcare, technology and innovation. So please help me welcome Abraham. Hey, how's it going? Uh, I'm Abraham Chang, member of the Antitrust and Competition Group at Norton Rose Fulbright, and I am happy to be here talking with you all about something that has attracted more than its fair share of attention in the last 12 months, and that is antitrust, particularly with how this administration has been approaching it. Um, now, I'm not going to rehash all of the basics of antitrust. Um, instead, what I'd like to do is go over some recent developments go over uh, some of the legislation that is being proposed, and then focus on three specific areas of interest, labor, data, and ESG, and how those topics intersect with antitrust. So just to set the table, last June, Lena Khan was sworn in as the chair of the FTC. For those who may not be familiar, the FTC's Bureau of Competition and the Department of Justice's Antitrust Division share concurrent jurisdiction in federal antitrust enforcement. This is, of course, in addition to the states who, um, you know, enforce the antitrust laws, their laws, through the state attorneys general, and as well as the private plaintiffs who can also bring suit. So, Chair Khan was expected to and has delivered on a plan to aggressively enforce the antitrust laws using every means at her disposal. A month after she was sworn in, President Biden issued an executive order, pictured here, setting forth his administration's policies and approach to antitrust generally. The big takeaway here is that antitrust is now a priority of this administration. Uh, I'm sure you all have noticed uh, this focus on antitrust has been bipartisan and you know, there is movement behind getting some sort of legislation passed. That being said, the parties do vary in how they expect these antitrust issues should be addressed and prioritized. And finally, in November of last year, Jonathan Kanner was confirmed to lead the antitrust division. Now, with the heads of antitrust enforcement finally in place, antitrust enforcement has begun to accelerate and we can expect to see more out of the agencies going forward. As you can see here, um, these are two quotes, one each from Lena Khan, Chair Khan, and Jonathan Kanner. I think the big takeaways here are that, one, the agencies are taking an aggressive approach to enforcement, and two, they are now looking at tools that have not traditionally been used. Uh, they're dusting off some old ones. They're asking Congress for new ones. They're asking for existing tools to be expanded or, in the case of Section 13, uh, replaced. So what does this all mean? And what has it meant? First of all, there's going to be some form of legislation passed, whether at the federal level or state level. Um, Support for antitrust reform is bipartisan. Uh, now what it looks like is going to, it's hard to say at this point. We are going to go over some of the bills that are being contemplated. Um, but fair to say something is going to happen, whether it's just additional funding for the antitrust enforcers, whether it's something more dramatic, like limiting uh, dominant tech platforms from certain acquisitions. Uh, to something maybe a little bit more extreme, like no mergers over the value of $5 billion. So those are all being tossed around right now, kicked around, um, and uh, we'll see where it all, all looks like in the coming years. Second of all, the contours of antitrust enforcement are changing. Uh, again, we're not sure what it's going to look like. Uh, certain tools are being contemplated right now, but uh, this is also probably why y'all are being bombarded and will continue to be bombarded with client alerts every time uh, these things happen, apologies in advance, but uh, it's worth knowing about. 
As an example, the antitrust division has announced that it intends to bring criminal charges for monopolization cases under Section 2. Uh, that is a departure from charging practice over the last 40 years, so uh, you know that's quite a big change. We'll delve into that a little further in. As another example, the FTC has announced its intent to pursue cases under Section 8 of the Clayton Act, and that prohibits interlocking directorates. If you aren't familiar with that piece of the Clayton Act, that's because it hasn't been enforced. So again, new tools are being contemplated, and we're, it's a time of change here with the antitrust enforcers. Third, if you are contemplating deals and your deals are above a certain size, um, and actually, if they're not above a certain size, they may still attract scrutiny. So involve your antitrust team early. In involve antitrust counsel early in transactions. Uh, have them conduct an initial antitrust assessment. Uh, they'll be able to advise on certain things like timing. Merger review is taking longer and longer, and there, it's expected to take uh, longer for the foreseeable future. Um, it, the enforcers have indicated that they're more willing to litigate Right, so there is, I would assume, less appetite for litigation on the part of the parties. Um, these are all things to consider as you're looking at your deals. Finally, certain industries are under scrutiny. If you're in big tech, if you're in pharmaceuticals, if you're in healthcare, you already know this. Um, you're, you're getting extra attention, right? But it's not just these uh, industries. President Biden's executive order addressed 72 different initiatives across a wide range of industries, agriculture, beverage, alcohol, you name it. And so, you know, it's a, it's a widespread enforcement mechanism. Uh, we're going to cover three topics that intersect with each of these uh, industries, data, labor, and ESG, and we'll cover what that looks like. So. The ABA antitrust spring meeting is a time when antitrust lawyers from all over the country convene in DC to discuss antitrust trends. It's also an opportunity for the top antitrust enforcers to share where antitrust enforcement is heading. So we have some takeaways from last week's uh, spring meeting. First, you have uh, changes to the leniency program uh, under the Department of Justice's leniency program. Uh, the updates are one, to qualify for a company has to promptly self-report, and two, the company must now undertake remedial measures to address the harm that it caused. Now, uh, these changes can be found in DOJ's updated justice manual if you're curious. Second, uh, he reiterated the division's preference for remedies over settlements in mergers, and what that looks like is divestitures. Consent decrees are no longer favored, um, and so any sort of structural remedies will be strong. And you know that's not really new, per se, in the last four years. That has been the case. But when you pair it with the last point, which is a greater willingness to litigate, what we have here is um, a sense that the enforcers are gearing up. They're gearing up to fight in court. Um, this is also uh, consistent with President Biden's funding. They've, he's allocated about $80 million for additional for um, the antitrust division to hire trial attorneys, ramp up its litigation abilities so that they can fight in court. Now, with respect to uh, Chair Khan, when she was asked what is the most significant antitrust reform that can come from Congress right now, she indicated clear, bright line rules that reduce the need for enforcers to showcase harm. So she wants legislation to be passed that makes it easier for enforcers to challenge mergers, to challenge conduct in court. Okay. Finally, uh, Holly Vadova, who leads the Bureau of Competition, she indicated that mergers are going to continue to take a while to review. No, this is not to say that you won't have mergers going through where you know there are no product overlaps, where uh, there aren't competitive issues. Those will still get through, you know, possibly without a second request, right? So within 60 days, even assuming a pull and refile. But you know, for the most part, mergers are going to take a, a long time, right? We've seen some mergers that uh, the investigations have taken over a year, so it's not unusual.
So here's the agenda for today. We're going to cover some legislation that's been contemplated. We're going to cover some regulatory developments, some of which I've just mentioned. Then we're going to cover uh, the enforcer's scrutiny on labor practices right now. Uh, we're going to cover data as competition. How does that intersect with antitrust? And then we're going to look at how antitrust and ESG intersect as well. First, let's go over some of the bills. I thought it'd be helpful to go over uh, some of these just in large bullet points, right? Uh, here we've got two bills from opposite sides of the aisle. We have Senator Klobuchar's bill, Competition and Antitrust Law Enforcement Reform Act, and then we have Senator Hawley's Trust Busting for the 21st Century Act. I think generally, and you'll see some of that here on this slide, but also in uh, subsequent slides, the three, I'd say, large themes for this legislation is one, acquisitions are going to be harder if you fall into certain buckets. Second of all, if you're a big tech platform, you know, the focus is on you and things are gonna be harder for you. And third, uh, a lot of these bills focus on making things easier for enforcers, right? Whether it's a venue statute or whether it's a presumption of harm, uh, these bills are intended to make life easier for enforcers so that they can challenge and win in courts. So, uh, going back to what I was saying about presumption of harm, Senator Klobuchar's bill makes it easier for enforcers to challenge mergers that result in over 50% market share. And that presumption of harm effectively flips the, the current paradigm, right? So, it requires businesses to prove that mergers are pro-competitive rather than first having the government and agencies prove that a merger is anti-competitive and then having uh, the businesses come back with pro-competitive justifications. So the burden is now on the businesses, or it would be if this bill were passed. And then you can see with Senator Hawley, big tech is being targeted by a number of these bills. Um, you know, certain acquisitions uh, are presumed to be anti-competitive. You have uh, certain conduct that is not allowed um, you know, manipulating certain search results, self-preferencing, things like that. You have certain bills that are intended to make antitrust law more administrable. So uh, the one on the left here uh, from Senator Klobuchar, it changes uh, and it defines what market power is and modifies the standard for an unlawful acquisition. If you're familiar with the Sherman Act, it is, and the Clayton Acts, they are uh, incredibly vaguely worded statutes, and uh, the large body of antitrust law that we have is dependent on courts interpreting those statutes. So she would uh, have Congress pass some definition of market power that makes it so that courts can more easily uh, deduce what that means, right? A, a big fight in antitrust is always what is the market? What's the relevant market in terms of geography? What's the relevant market in terms of what the product is, right? And so depending on how that is shaped, that often will decide whether or not a company has market power in the relevant market and therefore whether they're allowed to do what they want to do, whether it's you know, conduct or whether it's a merger, right? So that's you know, this particular bill on the left. And then here on the right, the American Innovation and Choice Online Act. It's more targeting toward the big online platforms, prohibits self-preferencing. You have um, concerns about data, right? Data privacy, how it's being used. Um, you know, we expect that data and privacy issues will bleed into traditional antitrust analysis more, at least on the enforcer's end, um, given that the FTC has declared a more holistic approach to antitrust enforcement. And we expect some of that will be championed by uh, Alvaro Bedoya, the privacy expert, uh, nominated by President Biden to be the fifth uh, FTC commissioner. And he hasn't been confirmed yet, but we expect when he is confirmed or if he's confirmed that we will see additional guidance from the FTC, particularly with respect to privacy, not just on the antitrust side. Now, not all bills are equally likely to be passed. I would say uh, the Prohibiting Any Competitive Mergers Act of 2022 is uh, more on the extreme side, right? You've got uh, 
no deals above the value of $5 billion. Uh, you've got a prohibition on all deals resulting in market shares over 33% for sellers or 25% for employers. Those are very low numbers, I think, uh, as we all understand. And it also removes merger litigation from the purview of the Supreme Court. So I, I think this is a little bit more out there. I'd be surprised if this particular bill passes. We also have the Platform Competition and Opportunity Act, and that pr is a blanket prohibition on acquisitions if you're a dominant online platform, unless it falls into one of these buckets. So these are really exceptions here on, on the right. Uh, you'll notice that there is a, uh, a clause for nascent or potential competitor, right? So that's a focus now with FTC. Um, they are concerned with dominant companies uh, snuffing out competition through uh, acquisitions and thereby removing competition in the long run from uh, benefiting consumers. So uh, when we review transactions nowadays, one of the questions we ask is what's in the pipeline, right? Is there a product coming down that's being developed in R&D that could potentially compete with the product that you're selling right now? And, you know, if there is, we'll need to have a good explanation for why it's the case that this is not a concern, right? Um, if you look at the Visa Plaid transaction, it, DOJ could have challenged that on, I think, a number of different grounds, but they decided to challenge it as a, an issue of a nascent competitor. Uh, they're concerned that Plaid actually could have developed into a large enough network uh, that it could compete with Visa. And so that was their, uh, their primary theory. But it is not just federal legislation. State attorneys general have been quite active in the last 24 months, and we've seen multiple states initiate litigation against large digital platforms. And it's not just the enforcers. Um, you have the state legislatures getting into action here. This is the New York's 21st Century Antitrust Act. Um, it would create the first state pre-merger notification filing threshold requirements. You, it's substantially lower than the HSR Act's filing requirements. And, you know, it makes illegal for companies certain behavior. If you have market share above 40%, if you're a seller, and 30% if you're a buyer, you're, it essentially codifies certain concepts in antitrust uh, where you have a certain uh, market share threshold, you are not allowed to engage in certain behavior. Now, this didn't pass last year. Uh, it passed the New York State Senate last year, but it died in assembly, and it must pass the Senate and assembly again this year. So it is not yet law, but it is being contemplated. It's being kicked around. And here are just a, a few other notable acts that, are, uh, that touch on antitrust enforcement, right? Um, the one on the left here, Journalism Competition and Preservation Act. Uh, the takeaway here is that small companies still do need a safe harbor because sometimes market share doesn't matter when it comes to antitrust analysis. Certain activities are always prohibited under the antitrust laws. These are called per se violations. For example, fixing prices or group boycotts, those are antitrust violations no matter how small you are in terms of market share. And so uh, this would provide the newspapers uh, or the, the publishers with uh, an antitrust exemption or protection so that they can negotiate with dominant online platforms like Google. Then you have the Bust Up Big Tech Act, and that prohibits covered platforms from selling their own uh, products or services on the platform. Uh, as you might imagine, this one is geared toward a very large platform called Amazon, but it would also affect some other ones. Then you have the State Antitrust Venue Enforcement Act. That is, I think, uh, an outgrowth of what has been going on in terms of the big tech litigation brought by state attorneys general. So um, for those who aren't litigators, uh, you ha when you have multiple cases in multiple jurisdictions that all kind of revolve around the same core facts, uh, you can be consolidated into an MDL jurisdiction. Basically, it's easier to administer this way. Um, 
the DOJ and FTC are exempt from this. They are allowed to bring their cases wherever, and they cannot have their cases kicked to another jurisdiction. But states are not uh, exempt from this. And so if you have a private plaintiff that sues Google in New York for you know, certain uh, conduct, you know, let's say self-preferencing, just you know, as an example, and then the state attorneys then sue in the, under their antitrust laws, they, it can all be consolidated. And so right now that is the case. This statute is intended to make it so that state attorneys general can choose their own venue. They can choose to sue in their state. They will not have their venue uh, changed later. So uh, to the extent that this is passed, a company could face uh, the same lawsuit or a lawsuit with the same facts, but you know, involving different statutes in multiple jurisdictions. And finally, we have the Open App Markets Act. Um, this is geared toward uh, the, digital, the digital realm. You have rules for access to platforms. You have rules for access to consumers. And um, I think this is also geared toward the dominant digital platforms. You know, you have the small app makers who are trying to um, access c customers, and then you have Google Play, you have an Apple Store, and so this is intended to address that issue. Shifting gears here to what I was talking about earlier with the criminal charges, um, while speaking at an ABA panel uh, on March 2nd of this year, Deputy Assistant General, uh, Assistant Attorney General of the Antitrust Division, Richard Powers, signal that DOJ intends to bring criminal charges for monopolization under Section 2 of the Sherman Act. So in the last 40 years, criminal enforcement has been sought only in Section 1 cases, and that involved group conduct. Right now, this announcement conceivably expands criminal enforcement to unilateral conduct. Generally, you know, when you have a, a Section 1 case, you have a conspiracy to you know, fixed prices, you have some sort of horizontal market allocation, meaning that, you know, uh, one company says, don't come into my territory, don't sell in my territory, um, I won't come and sell in your territory, right? Now this is, this is changing the game a little bit. That being said, I'm not trying to scaremonger here, there will be plenty of advance notice. Um, Everyone will have plenty of time to read up on um, whatever guidance it is that DOJ provides, as well as all the client alerts that are going to be circulated. Um, this is uh, a familiar pattern with the DOJ. Um, in 2016, DOJ announced its intent to start bringing criminal charges under Section 1 for no poach cases. Right? It soon released its guidance for HR professionals. However, it did not actually bring any criminal charges until January 2021 against surgical care affiliates, which we'll cover. So um, I think we can expect formal guidance soon, and then soon after, we'll, you know, there will be additional comments from the enforcers on what this is going to look like. More regulatory updates. The FTC and DOJ are working together to update the merger review guidelines yet again. So uh, in 2020, the vertical merger guidelines were updated. Um, given the skepticism that Chair Khan and others have expressed about the current vertical merger guidelines, or actually they've been rescinded since, so I guess it's fair to say they're no longer current. Um, it's safe to say that they're going to update the vertical merger guidelines and likely also the horizontal merger guidelines from 2012. So there's going to be a focus on data aggregation strategies. There's going to be a focus on how mergers affect labor markets. And there's going to be a focus on um, what kinds of evidence that enforcers can look at and courts should look at when it comes to antitrust harm. Uh, traditionally, you, you might engage an economist and argue about whether prices are going to increase, but now I think they're looking at a more holistic approach. Let's talk about labor. So DOJ's attentions uh, on the labor practices of you know, various companies have been uh, it's been going on for some time now, at least since 2016, when it announced that it would be pursuing criminal enforcement against no-poach conduct. 
And then things were relatively quiet until about you know, 18 months ago, and DOJ has since brought several criminal cases in connection with wage fixing and no poach agreements. So you've got a list here. Um, as you can see, they are mostly healthcare or healthcare adjacent cases, but not all of them. You've got uh, an aerospace engineering company and it's no poach agreements. Um, US v. Jindal was interesting in that it was the first criminal wage fixing case uh, brought. And their motion for dismiss, the defendants argued that wage fixing had never been a criminal violation and so this case should be dismissed. The judge rejected that argument and so that case um, you know, went to trial or is going to trial. You have uh, DeVita, actually, which is, uh, they just finished trial yesterday, and so that case is with the jury now. Here's another example of DOJ's focus on the labor market, this time in the merger context. So DOJ challenged a merger between publishers Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster, and they claimed that it would result in substantial harm to authors, particularly authors of anticipated top-selling books. Now, traditionally, the antitrust analysis focuses on consumers. It focuses on whether consumers are harmed through higher prices, whether they're harmed through um, you know, decreased choice, for example. But here, the focus is not on consumers. The focus is on uh, the labor market, the authors. And so uh, the alleged harms aren't about higher prices for books. They're about you know, the lack of competition resulting in depressed pay, right? And there is a mention of quality and variety of published books, but really that is tied to the compensation for authors. Um, it's unclear at this point if this is a trend uh, and whether DOJ is now looking at labor more broadly, and even though labor might be ancillary to the actual merger, uh, we'll see. And in the private litigation context, plaintiff's attorneys are always happy to make allegations about harm to labor. This isn't exactly a wage fixing case, although it, it sort of is. It's really more of a price fixing case where dairy co-ops uh, shared price information and then coordinated to drive down the price of milk. The workers here being the farmers, right? But in the US v. Jindal case, the court actually denied the motion to dismiss based on the reasoning that wage fixing is a form of price fixing. So. That particular distinction is blurring to some extent here. And there have always been class actions brought uh, for alleged wage fixing. I worked on a, a class action brought on behalf of nurses um, for claiming that you know, hospitals had fixed their, uh, their wages. And that case had been going on for over 15 years by the time I hopped on. So class actions uh, definitely can be based off of labor practices and particular wage fixing. So non-competes and no poaches. At this point, I'm sure you're wondering what's the deal here. Uh, I'm sure many of you have experience with no poach and non-competes and uh, you haven't been hit with an antitrust suit. And that's because generally speaking, as long as they're appropriately tailored, narrowly tailored, uh, no, non-competes and no poaches are legal which is not to say that non-competes don't have their own issues, right? So non-competes typically prevent former employees from working for a competitor within a certain area, within a certain time frame. Generally, it's got to be a short, relatively short time frame and a relatively, a reasonably limited geographical area. Um, and it's very state specific. Uh, oftentimes, if you're not paying attention, your non-compete will either be unenforceable or worse, a violation of state law. And there are state laws being contemplated right now, for example, in California, that would make uh, place non-competes within uh, the purview of some antitrust statutes. So now we've all seen the cases that were just on the screen here about uh, criminal, char criminal charges being brought against no poach cases, but that doesn't mean that all of them will be pursued criminally or even that all of them are illegal, right? So no poach cases, as long as they're ancillary to another agreement, another lawful agreement, are usually permitted. And you've got to be careful in how you're tailoring them. But, you know, for example, if you've got a JV and you include a no poach clause in there uh, to prevent the other firm from approaching your employees, that should be okay. 
Um, what you can't do is have two companies uh, basically agree to not approach each other's employees with no other deal. Just, we're not, I'm not gonna, you know, this is better for both of us if we don't lose our employees sort of agreement. That's a naked no poach agreement and that is uh, illegal and you could be subject to criminal charges or at least to civil action. So let's take a look at what sort of behavior is illegal under the antitrust laws. Uh, the allegations in the complaint here, I think, speak to two things. First, there was an agreement uh, between companies not to poach each other's employees. And then two, they were enforced, right? You, they, in this complaint right here, says that they agreed in meetings not to solicit each other's senior level employees. Uh, then they told the recruiters not to solicit senior level employees, and then they monitored compliance by requiring uh, those who were applying to report that they were applying, right? So you've got the agreement, you've got uh, the enforcement of that agreement, and so let's just take a look at what that looks like in terms of the allegations. Here are some examples of what not to do. Um, or maybe put another way, here are examples of the types of evidence that will uh, come up in a, either a criminal or a civil case. You have emails, you have calls between individuals. You know, I had a conversation with X about people and we reached an agreement that we would not approach each other's, uh, I'm assuming it would be employees proactively, right? please don't schedule a call with this candidate. Um, we can't reach out to this, these people's folks. Take any of these folks off the list, right? So I guess the big takeaway here is don't agree to do this behavior, but there are also some ancillary takeaways as well. Uh, one being that you can see that much of the evidence here is an email form. And with DeVita here, it's more of the same. You can see that there are email exchanges between the alleged participants to the agreement. You know, note that company A, another competitor, and DeVita are off limits to us, right? Putting two companies in italics, we can recruit the junior folks, but we can't recruit with the senior folks unless uh, they've already told their boss that they want to leave, right? These are all emails. It's hard to argue that there isn't an agreement when you, have, when you have emails like this. So, you know, generally speaking, you're going to want to instruct your, uh, your team not to put things in email form in a way that they can be misconstrued, right? What if there isn't an agreement, right? What if you're not agreeing to, you know, refrain from poaching another company's uh, candidates or employees? This still applies to you. Right? You should still avoid phrases like gentleman's agreement. I thought there was a gentleman's agreement between us and DeVita repoaching. Um, you should encourage your team to avoid phrases like this. We've seen situations where you get in trouble even if you haven't done anything wrong. Uh, for example, this is a, a personal experience here. Uh, company A wants to buy company B. It's a sizable transaction in a relatively concentrated market, which means you have to submit HSR filings, and because it's a relatively concentrated market, you draw a second request. The parties produce millions of documents in response to this second request. One email mentions a gentleman's agreement, and then for a few lines down mentions that a prospective employee won't be hired. You had a merger investigation on your hand, at first, but all of a sudden, you've also got a DOJ criminal investigation on your hands. Um, now, the guy who sent that email was not referring to a no poach, but it took months and attorney's fees and a whole lot of stress to prove that. And not to mention the effect it had on the deal. Of course, the deal still went forward, but talk about throwing a monkey wrench into the proceedings. So I would encourage you to uh, encourage your teams to avoid phrases that can be misconstrued or set off red flags with the agencies. I would guess that the agencies, when they get these, your production will probably run some screens for phrases like gentlemen's agreement. Um, and so 
if you're responding to a second request or if you're making a production to the government, I would also encourage you to run some back-end screens on whatever productions you're making for phrases like this. Uh, it can save you a whole lot of headache, even if you don't have some sort of agreement to, you know, not to poach another company's employees. All right. Moving on to data. So data is an area that uh, it's still developing how it intersects with antitrust. There are a few ways of looking at data within the antitrust context. And I th so let's start with the first one, the simplest, which is data as the product, right? If you're looking at it this way, data is no different than eggs or healthcare. Uh, if you operate in a space where data is bought and sold, then you know, this applies to you. Here are two examples of the uh, data as a product market, right? In both of these cases, you had companies trying to acquire or merge with other companies uh, where they focused on selling data, right? What you can see here is, you know, they had relatively high market shares in the data that they were selling and what that data was, you know, one case it was marketing to K through 12 educators, and the other one was about ratings and reviews uh, for vendors. So relatively niche, that's how they acquired, I guess, the, the high market share that would raise red flags. Um, now these cases are about 10 years ago, but this is just to show you that data, when it's viewed as a product, it's not that different from any other product. The enforcers will look at it, they'll look at market, uh, market concentration, they'll look at risks of you know, increasing prices and reducing product quality. You know, they'll look at head-to-head -head competition, whether you're acquiring or merging with a competitor. They'll look at these things uh, because they're considering data as the product. Now, here's something that is still developing and is, is interesting and antitrust scholars are paying attention. This is the idea of data as consumer harm. Uh, and this is probably where uh, this intersects m most greatly with data and data privacy and how that's being treated under the antitrust laws. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, we expect to see more movement from the FTC uh, if privacy expert Alvaro Bedoya is confirmed as the fifth FTC commissioner. We expect there will be some changes. You know, I've heard things kicked around like um, attacking the standard uh, notice and consent rules right now with respect to clicking through acknowledgments, things like that. Um, they, the FTC is currently looking at that. But here's the idea, right? Traditionally, under antitrust analysis, the harm to the consumer is... Uh, really found in higher prices. It's found in taking certain products off of the shelves, you know, so you can't buy them. Uh, things like that. Maybe the quality of the product is worse. Maybe you're discontinuing support, etc. There, That's the consumer harm that we're talking about. Here, you can see that the FTC's expanding its view of what consumer harm looks like. Now, with uh, the FTC's litigation against Facebook, what you have is the FTC pushing the bounds of traditional antitrust analysis. They want to argue that you know, Facebook has provided lower levels of data protection, lower levels of privacy, because it didn't have any competitors. You know, if you, if you use Facebook, you know, and for a long, and now I guess there's Instagram, but really it's owned by Facebook, right? You had to use Facebook. There were no other options. There were no other options that were providing greater levels of privacy or data protection. Um, if you look at the lawsuit brought by um, DuckDuckGo, they are a search engine that uh, prioritize data uh, protection and privacy, and they lost on a motion to dismiss, if I recall. Um, that's, I think, because courts move more slowly than the enforcers do, and, you know, if DuckDuckGo had brought its suit maybe, let's say, five years in from now, we don't know what that would look like, right? So the courts haven't quite caught up yet, but the FTC believes that, um, the definition of consumer harm should be expanded to include data. Now here's a, 
another example of you know, how data intersects with antitrust. Let's say you want to leverage your own data. Uh, you may need to be careful about how you do it. And as with so much of antitrust, it's fact specific. Now, for example, uh, let's say you're a company or a large distributor, let's say, and you want to make the jump online to make your own branded e-commerce platform. You've been working with other e-commerce platforms in the past because you didn't have your online capabilities, but now you've realized you want to bring that in-house. You want to put out your own uh, e-commerce platform. You want to control your interactions with your customers. You want to control uh, maybe customer uh, service, quality. So you decide you want to stop working with these other platforms and you want to promote just your platform. Well, what if the e-commerce platform that you've been working with is upset that they no longer get your business or maybe that they no longer have access to the data that you, you, know, you were getting from your customers, right? They no longer have insight into how your customers are buying things. They no longer have uh, insight into all the advertising, all the, all the data, you know, whether it's you know, analytics regarding amount spent, whether it's about you know, time of shopping, et cetera. They no longer have you know, access to that. They're upset. They could sue you for monopolization under Section 2. And in fact, we have dealt with lawsuits related to this, where they sue you. Uh, and actually, if you're, you know, let's say, several large distributors or several large companies in the industry all do this relatively in the same time frame, you might have a Section 1 claim on your hands where you know, they're claiming that all of these large players conspired to keep the e-commerce platform out of the business, right? Here's some questions to consider. Are you doing this unilaterally? That would be preferable. Um, you have much stronger antitrust arguments to make when that is the case because generally a company can choose with whom it deals. Um, under the refusal to deal uh, doctrine in antitrust, you, know, you, you can choose so long as you know, it's unilateral and you are not, you know, there's not a certain exception called the Aspen skiing exception where you have a prolonged course of dealing, right? And so you want to talk about your valid business reasons for you know, making this jump. You're going to want to kind of discuss within your team. You're going to want to avoid uh, putting out emails that can be misconstrued as you're making this business decision. So that's just another way in which antitrust and data are, are kind of, and I guess business, are intersecting. Shifting gears to ESG. ESG, what is it? Uh, you all know what it is. Uh, I'm still going to go over it really quick anyways, apologies, but you know, you have the environmental component of it, right, which considers how a company, its policies, its practices uh, interact with uh, stewardship of the planet. Then you've got the social component, how do the company's uh, practices interact with the communities in which it operates, right, as well as its relationships with its employees and suppliers and customers, things like that. Then you've got the governance piece of it, which is uh, the company's leadership, its accountability, its transparency to its shareholder concerns, right? So when you see ESG, what do you think of? Usually it's initiatives like reducing carbon emissions, sustainable practices, certain social movements, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. What does this have to do with antitrust? I would say that it generally has to do with group conduct. If you want to engage in any of these things, reducing carbon emissions, uh, diver, you know, promote certain diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts within your company unilaterally, it's not a problem. There's no intersection with antitrust at all. It's where you, multiple companies, or let's say the industry leaders, get together and decide they want to you know, promote some of these goals that you run into issues. So industry-wide ESG initiatives uh, can bring firms under antitrust scrutiny, you know, pledges, to meet certain low emission standards, sustainability figures, diversity metrics. Uh, the large takeaway here is that ESG is treated like everything else. There aren't any exceptions. This isn't quite like the EU where they're throwing around um, certain exemptions for competition where you're promoting uh, sustainability, right? 
Um, ESG in the United States is treated like all the other efforts you might have, all the other group conduct. And so you can see how you might run into issues. Let's say, for example, uh, the largest insurers in the world all decide they want to cut certain companies out of the portfolio because they're not uh, environmental friendly. That would support a group boycott claim. There is no protection for that. Um, agreements or conduct that enable price fixing, such as sharing uh, competitively sensitive information, maybe about, okay, well, you know, we cut our production by 20%. You know, how about you? Did you cut your production by 20%? Yeah. That would also support, uh, you know, an antitrust claim, or at least it would increase your antitrust risk. That being said, the creation and monitoring of industry standards or benchmarks, um, it can be okay as long as it's done in a, a general, high-level, and non-binding way, right? So over here, you've got, you know, you, you can't agree to fix prices, you can't agree to ice out certain, uh, let's say, companies maybe further down, downstream or upstream that you don't believe are supporting your goals. Uh, that'd be a group boycott, right? However, you can act individually and you can agree to agree to agree to do something in a kind of a vague and broad way at this time, right? At, once uh, legislation is passed and it may be the case that um, the FTC and DOJ move in this direction once they see what the EU does and, you know, the effects that that has, right? Um, we may see something different. But in the meantime, this is the current state of affairs. ESG is not treated any differently. That being said, if you want to do something with uh, other competitors, uh, one way you might consider it is uh, submitting a business review request. And what that is is you explain your proposal to DOJ or to FTC and they will review and get back to you, and you can always choose to, uh, you know, withdraw your letter before it gets made public. Um, the D Department of Justice will look at this proposal, they'll ask for details, and then they'll either provide you with a, you know, a, a comfort letter, so to speak, saying, you know, we, it, we are unlikely to bring an enforcement action against this particular behavior, or they will let you know that uh, they are likely to challenge this type of behavior, at which point, you know, and it's not made public, and you can withdraw your letter. Um, the current list of business review letters is made available um, online, you know, on their website, and so you can have a sense of what is acceptable behavior and what is not acceptable behavior. Uh, that being said, that's not a quick process. It is a long and drawn out process, and, and you will need to have uh, particulars about what arrangement you're proposing. Last, there are some limited reports of FTC staffers asking for information as part of, uh, you know, initial conversations about a merger or, you know, as part of a second request. Um, these topics, I think, are generally, they've been labor-focused, and so although, you know, that touches on ESG, it's, it might really just be a, a focus on labor and trying to detect um, illegal labor practices. That being said, this could be a part of the FTC's holistic approach. And so we're not really sure how this is going to develop um, and whether that's going to play any part in merger review in the future. All right, takeaways. Things are changing. The FTC and DOJ and the states are all being more aggressive and proactive. And so as these enforcement tools get um, made public, compliance teams should stay on top of it. If you're considering a deal, loop in your antitrust counsel early. They'll be able to advise on how long this deal is going to take, um, or at least roughly guess. They're going to be able to tell you whether this is going to be challenged. You know, if you've got a, a company with 80% market share trying to acquire, you know, a small company that makes a competing product, that's going to be difficult. Um, not to say it can't get through, but you're probably looking at a second request. Um, They'll be able to advise on whether you need to build in certain protections for yourself, like a walk-away clause, things like that. With respect to labor, stay on top of 
you know, uh, no poach and non-competes, make sure that uh, they've been vetted appropriately. Labor practices generally are experiencing greater scrutiny, so just be aware of that. With respect to data, things are shifting, but I think within the next 12 months, we'll have a better idea of what that's going to look like with respect to um, data and consumer harm. I, if data and consumer harm uh, go in the way of the FTC, and courts agree that consumer harm can be defined by uh, harm to you know, your privacy, harm to your uh, data protection, then antitrust litigation is going to expand. And last but not least, ESG initiatives are not immune to antitrust enforcement. So avoid agreements. That's the safest route. Do things unilaterally. If you're going to agree to things, uh, they should be very high level and non-binding. So that's all I've got for today. Um, are there any questions? Hi. Yes. So what does that look like? How do they, how do they find out about the deal just through per public announcements? And then what, what does that review look like? Great question. So if you don't submit an HSR filing, they'll probably hear about it from a competitor who's upset or some other you know, downstream, upstream, someone is upset, right? Which is you know, how a lot of this gets raised. And at that point, they'll send you a CID, right? And they'll, they'll ask for an investigation and then they'll inform you. And essentially from the CID, you'll have to explain you know, your justifications for the transaction. So as long as no one's upset, you're probably okay.